Focus on Environment, brought to you by Sight Loss Friendly Church from Torch Trust. Um, welcome everyone to our Focus on session. Uh, today we're looking at Focus on the Environment. Um, and we've really sort of put this together, um, sort of thinking at the moment, in, days are getting shorter. Um, we're often at more hours in the dark uh, than we would normally be. Um, so we'd be thinking about how people with sight loss move around your church building. Um, we're going to cover how to determine the type and quality of lighting that works best for someone with sight loss, how to indicate steps uh, both inside and outside a building, making doors safer, um, and also the, the layout in general of your uh, buildings. Obviously, some churches are very static on the inside, whereas others uh, are more adaptable and do change. Um, and we're also going to look very briefly at canes and guide dogs and how they uh, can assist people um, with sight loss. So um, our first area we're going to be thinking about is lighting. So while there is no uh, single solution uh, to lighting as such, um, there's often fairly simple uh, approaches that can improve lighting. And good lighting is really, really important for people. Um, effective lighting boosts confidence and, um, and just supports people to be more independent. Um, and it's also a benefit that's um, appreciated by the majority of the population, not just people with sight loss, um, but also people um, with other sensory loss. So it's helpful for people with learning disabilities or dementia. So it's a really good thing to be aware of and to think about the lighting in your own buildings. Um, the residual vision of partially sighted people may be uh, severely compromised in environments that are not lit well. And sometimes this is unavoidable. For example, you may be having a service where you're making use of candles and we're, we're coming up to Christmas when there may well be candlelit services. And, and that's, you know, that's understandable and, and um, those sort of things do happen. Um, but in general, um, it's, it's very, it's good to have um, well-lit, well-lit buildings um, and an even level of ambient light throughout a building is um, the best way to have it. So this allows people to move around safely and also gives them sufficient light for specific tasks. So if you are going to have a service that's maybe a bit different and you're having the lights off and you're having candles, it's just really good to be make sure people are aware and fully aware of that that's going to happen. So even, even levels of lighting mean that people's eyes do not need to readjust significantly to different light levels when they move around. Um, so lighting from more than one source is likely to be more effective than light from a single point. So I've got a couple of pictures just to show you. Now these are kind of diagrams of a home, but the same principles apply to any building. Uh, so let me just share this with you now. So the first picture um, is uh, showing um, it's a room that's lit by a single point and you can obviously see where the the shadow falls. So the person reading the book has got more light than the person at the table. And then obviously, if you have lights at various points in the room, um, you can see you've got even, even distribution of light around the room. Um, so it's just a really good principle to follow when you're thinking about uh, your own buildings and the light that is in it. Um, churches aren't always the best lit buildings um, but you know if it is if you have got to a point where you may be rethinking about that and obviously that can be an expensive thing to do but um, it's just good to be aware of where you're putting light and uh, and trying to have an even balance so lighting should always be um, sufficient for the tasks on orientation and movement so a minimum level of light from natural and or artificial sources should be provided for ambient and task specific purposes. It should also be even across different areas and with minimum glare. Um, so deep shadows or sharp changes in light levels from one room to another or within rooms should be avoided and light levels should be as even as possible. So to minimize glare, the bright areas of light sources should not be directly visible from normal directions of view. So you can use shades or diffusers 
um, to help prevent direct glare. Um, and steps should be trying to taken really to minimize glare. Um, so that could be from the lighting itself, but also from projector screens and windows. Um, and in modern buildings, especially, it may be necessary to install blinds to limit the amount of sunlight entering through a particular window at different times of the day. Um, lighting should also be um, adjustable for flexibility. Um, so providing, um, being able to kind of change it and adapt it is really helpful to accommodate different times of the day and the different needs depending on what's happening. Um, so in the event that people with sight loss are pho photophobic, um, then they should be able to account for this themselves by wearing appropriate eyewear usually, usually thick glasses. Um, sudden changes in light should be avoided or announced if unavoidable. For example, if you're, um, you need to make it clear when the lights are to be switched on, um, at the, it may be at the, the end of a candlelit service or something, um, or switched off at the beginning, whatever that may be. Um, and also just thinking about your entrances and external lighting. Um, lighting at entrances is obviously important at night, um, provides a safe and navigable access when arriving and leaving. Um, and it's often to have appropriate to have high, really high level lighting. Um, external lighting needs to be on the approach to the building so that it identifies the door from a distance. And also so there's a, a, stay, a safe transit from the road to the door as well. So lights over the door and on external steps and on the pathway are very helpful. Um, and also light, lighting up the sides of the pathway um, so that the, the route can be seen clearly. And stairs as well is another area where you do need to have good lighting. Um, lighting at the head and the foot of stairs and on landings can reduce the risk of falls and trips. So it must be positioned to improve contrast between stair treads and risers. So if you've only got lighting at the top of the staircase, um, you'll light the treads, but you'll leave the risers in shadow. So the light source and the bright parts of the light fitting should be kept out of the field of view as far as possible. Um, and it can be a good, good idea to use large light fittings on stairways so that light is emitted to a larger area um, at a relatively low brightness. So um, you're kind of spreading the light over the whole of the stairs. Um, so that's lighting. There is more, there's uh, lots of information in the handout. So if you haven't taken it all in, don't worry, we'll send you that afterwards. Um, I'm going to hand over to Matthew now, and he's going to think more about, so we sort of talked about lighting stairs, but he's going to be thinking a bit more about stairs in general. Thank you, Becky, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. So yes, so steps, um, they occur either outside or inside, and I'm going to talk about both of those in this section. So we'll start with outside and um, I don't actually know the precise regulations that that govern it but I do know that steps outside are, are governed by building regulations if they were installed after a certain period of time and uh, essentially what you need to do for steps outside is install corduroy paving so this is paving with uh, I, I don't call it corduroy paving I call it ridgy paving um, and you install it at the top and the bottom of all flights of stairs um, and it should have good colour contrast with the remainder of the pavement so that partially sighted people uh, can see it. So Becky's got some uh, pictures to show you of what that corduroy paving actually looks like. We'll add some pictures into the handout as well so you can <laughs> see what they look like as well. While Becky shows that picture, um, I'll tell you that um, where a flight of steps uh, is interrupted by a landing, uh, you don't need to worry so much about corduroy paving uh, as long as there is a continuous handrail. Uh, so for example, if you've got uh, a flight of steps going up and then you've got a bit of a break and then you've got another flight of steps going up, you need corduroy paving at the bottom of the first flight of steps and corduroy paving at the top of the last flight of steps, but not necessarily between the two flights of steps, unless the handrail breaks, in which case, please do put corduroy 
paving there to uh, to show when the next flight of steps starts. This is particularly important when you go down steps. Uh, it, you know, it's not very easy to fall up a step, but it's very easy to fall down steps. There is actually a government book. Uh, it's called Guidance on the Use of Tactile and uh, section 2.5.2 uh, talks about this uh, corduroy paving. It also talks about various other forms of, uh, of tactile paving and it's a useful um, adjunct to the building regs and you can find a link to that in the handout that we'll send around afterwards. There is another type of paving called blister paving, uh, what I affectionately call bobble paving. Uh, this is used for crossings. I think Becky might have a picture to show of this exclusively used for crossings and uh, various other restricted use cases like for example the edges of train station platforms. Please do not use bobble paving or blister paving uh, as an alternative use to corduroy paving um, because we, we will expect it to be a crossing and so we might stop and wait for traffic but we won't be expecting steps so we'll, we'll wait for traffic, we'll realise there's no traffic coming, we'll step as if to step onto the road and step down off the steps and, and that could be extremely dangerous. It's almost better to have no paving at all than to have tactile paving where you mean ridgy paving. That is a, a serious hazard, so please um, don't do that. It's, I've talked about handrails already. Um, it is good practice to install um, a handrail uh, or to have something to hold on to. It might be a, you know, it might be a wall or something, but um, <clears throat> to have a handrail uh, at either end of the width of a flight of steps. So don't just put a handrail on the right hand side, you know, put uh, a handrail on the left hand side as well, uh, wherever that is possible. Um, if it's not possible, then obviously um, don't do it. But there are very few cases in which actually not putting a handrail there is, is not possible. If we turn our attention to steps inside, uh, a multi-storey building, uh, <laughs> that sounds like a multi-storey car park, doesn't it? But um, where there are sizable flights of steps. So I'm talking about, for example, a church with a church hall above or function room above or something like that. I'm talking about proper flights of steps here. Um, so where there's a decent flight of steps in a multi-storey building, uh, it's good practice to install corduroy surfaces uh, and handrails for staircases between stories as per outside of a building. And again, we've got some pictures to show you. I realise um, this is more of a modern building thing than an older building thing. Um, if you have an older building and you don't want to disturb the uh, decor of the building by installing corduroy surfaces inside, um, there are other things you can do to make steps a bit easier. Um, a, a change of surface is a really good idea, but you can do it in all sorts of ways. Uh, provided that you can feel that change of surface underfoot. So for example, um, if your steps are carpeted uh, and your floor is not carpeted otherwise, that's a good way to do it. So you know, if you've got hard floors, put some carpet down on the steps. Or if you've got carpeted floors, uh, take the carpet up on the, uh, on the steps, or at the very least on the section of floor that leads up to the steps so that we know that there are steps coming. Um, what you should try and avoid uh, is changes from, for example, a tile floor to a wooden floor because uh, that won't be picked up uh, underfoot. If you're in a church that's on essentially one level, but you've got the odd step here or there. So, for example, uh, if you're in the, the congregation, if you're in the nave of the church and you've got a step up to the chancel um, or, or a step up to the altar, a change of surface there isn't really necessary. I mean, it's a little bit inconvenient if you fall down those steps and uh, and you, you probably avoid it if at all possible, but it's only one or two steps and people will usually get used to it. So, and also people will usually walk up those steps before they walk down those steps. So certainly for me, if I'm in the congregation, I've got to walk up a step to get to the altar. I know I've walked up a step, so I'm going to be sufficiently cautious uh, while I'm on that level until I felt myself going down the same number of steps as I've gone up. That said, <clears throat> some partially sighted people um, who are solely relying on their residual vision to navigate, as in they don't have a cane, they don't have a guide dog, they're just using their eyes, may not have any depth perception. And in that case, they won't see the step going up or going down until they've tripped on it. So although it's not necessary to make it 
uh, obvious underfoot, uh, what you should have um, is you should have um, good colour contrast between the edge of a step and the remainder of the floor so that people who are just using their sight can see there's an edge coming up and, and you know there's, there's something interesting going on here and to uh, take, take a bit more care. At the most basic level, a strip of coloured tape across the entirety of the width of the top of the bottom step uh, will suffice. It's important to go across the entire width of the step. Don't just put it in the middle of the step, but go entirely from left to right and, and on the bottom step and the top step, because people will then know uh, not to trip up the step or trip down the step. Alternatively, uh, if the steps are edged, so for example, if you've got uh, car uh, uh, cardboard carpeted uh, steps with wooden edging, uh, ensure that the colour of the edging is sufficiently different to the colour of the rest of the floor covering. Um, we've got some pictures of that as well, I believe. Um, different people with sight loss will experience colour contrast differently. We always talk about think, ask, act. Um, we've talked about the thinking and we've talked about the acting. We haven't talked about the asking. And if you've got somebody with sight loss in your church and you're making accommodations specifically uh, for that person, then it's a really good idea to ask that person because they will tell you uh, what colour contrast works best for them. Otherwise, I'm afraid you're just going to have to uh, make a decision. And as long as the colour contrast is good, that's fine. But be prepared to adapt that, you know, down the line if you get somebody with sight loss who needs a slightly different colour contrast. I'm going to pass back over to Becky to talk about doors. Before I do, uh, it's an opportunity for anybody who wants to to ask any questions uh, about anything that we've covered so far, either in the chat uh, or by unmuting um, yeah, I've got a question. Would there be um, grants available for churches who need to do this, um, ad uh, uh, these adaptations? That's an extremely good question. And I'm afraid <laughs> I don't just have the answer quite off the top of my head. I think probably there will be, but I think it will depend on the adaptations that you're trying to make and um that how wealthy the church is and you know the denomination of the church you know some church denominations might have grants available uh, some church denominations might have restrictions on the grants that you can use so for example there might be some grants from say the national lottery or something like that um but you might want to check that your church is actually allowed to use uh national lottery grants for that sort of thing um i think if you want to email us off this if you email slfc at torchtrust.org with perhaps a bit more information and we can look into that for you thank you very much thank you hi diana you've got your hand up um yes matthew um with dementia i think the color of contrast used to be yellow but is now red and i was just wondering if you had to pick a color when you didn't know somebody's particular requirements whether red would be the one now to pick possibly but i think it depends as much on what your other surface is if you've got red carpet down on the floor already uh, you probably don't want to have a red no. um, step no. edging and mm -hmm. um so i don't really want to talk too much about which color is the best right. color because i say right. it, it depends on the surrounding color of of the floor Right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Oh, hello. Hello. Hi, Penny. Hey. Uh, I'm just going to ask. We've got a, we've got about four or five steps down into our church, the main entrance, and we've got blue carpet on it, like a sort of light navy blue. And what we've put in is some lights on the steps. But there's quite. I'm not 100 percent sure how helpful. I think they're probably better than nothing, possibly, but. It's sort of obviously, it sort of just, it's like little spot, three little spotlights down onto them. Um, and obviously there's little different shadows and things. And I'm not really quite sure how helpful they are and how helpful you would think they would be. That is a good question. I, I think you probably uh, perhaps need to talk to people at, at your church and, mm -hmm. <laughs> and see how helpful they are. Have it, not being able to experience them ourselves, it's probably no, hard to no. say, but... Um, Maybe worth talking to people and um, mm. yeah, finding out how how they're finding things. If there are people with sight loss in your congregation, out of curiosity, what colour is the rest of the floor? 
well it's it's sort of pale natural stone okay so you've so you've put some blue carpet on the steps but not anywhere else on the on the floor covering not in the main body of the church once you get into the main body of the church oh, all except up up on the chancel and the side yeah. that's got the same blue carpet mm. so i mean i, I can't really comment no. on the contrast between the blue and the stone um becky might be able to but i mean if as long as it contrasts well i mm. think the contrast probably should be sufficient for at least some people to be able to find the steps because yeah so they'll at least see, when it gets the, to the bottom yeah yeah that they'll see the other color and they'll think hang on what's what's going yeah. on here why is this a different yeah. color and it will make them stop and pay attention yes yeah, yeah. That, that's just what i was going to say is is the contrast the most important thing so say you've got dark blue carpet you'd want the edges in white or yellow but if you've got a light color carpet you might want the edges in a dark red or something is the contrast the most important thing yes i think you, you do yeah you do need a good good contrast so um yeah definitely yeah we've, we've got no contrast on the actual individual steps but then there's there's a stone step at the top and that has got a white strip on the edge of it yeah, well, uh, yeah, I mean, it might be worth just, yeah, having some conversations about, yes. I guess. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Can I just say, you, you raise a very, very good point that I hadn't covered in the handout and hadn't thought about, but it's amazing how many people, when they count steps, forget either the top step or the bottom step or both. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly important when you're going down steps. The top step um is is actually one below where you think the, the, the floor essentially is the top step so if you're trying to dis distinguish steps by surfaces mm -hmm. and you're you've got stone but and and carpet but the carpet doesn't start until the first step the person's gonna be on the floor until they get to the first step you know so then they'll they'll miss the carpet so that you need to make sure that if you're identifying steps by a change of surface that the change of surface goes onto the floor above the top step slightly so that people feel it before they actually get to the steps right mm, okay thank you helpful thank you well or, or do something else if you can't if you can't put the surface before the you know up on the floor then put a, um, a colored strip or possibly a, you know a strip of wood or a strip of metal or something just something to show hang on th there is some difference coming up mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, we'll have we'll have a chance for some uh, more questions as well later on. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about doors and uh, doorways, uh, and I've got some uh, slides to share with you as well. So first of all, to say doorways, as with steps, um, it's a good practice to ensure that there is a good color contrast between doors and the surrounding walls, um, and also between doors and handles. So uh, there's kind of a, an example there for you. Um, but if, if possible, it's, it's good to kind of highlight the doorway and where the door is. Um, and partially sighted people may um, encounter particular difficulties when there are transparent doors, like glass doors. I know it's quite a trend in churches at the moment to have glass doors and they do let lots of light in um, and uh, yeah, look, look very nice and modern. Um, but glass doors aren't always very helpful. Uh, I came across a story when we were sort of researching this um, uh, from Apple, I mean, you've all heard of the big company Apple. Uh, so they've, they've uh, built a huge uh, new offices, I think it was possibly in about 2017, um, and lots and lots of glass has been used in the building because uh, it's very modern and it, it looks very sleek. Um, and anyway, there was a, there's a report online, you could probably find it yourself in Time magazine, about how various employees have been smashing into these glass uh, walls and doors because they just don't see them. So it's not just people that are partially sighted that might have trouble with glass doors. Um, and the, the article says that um, the employees were, were putting post-it notes on the glass to try and make sure that they were aware the glass was there. Um, and then they were being taken out down by other people in Apple because it didn't look good anymore with the post-it notes. So uh, there you go. <laughs> I thought that was quite funny that even a large company like that was having trouble with glass. So I've got a few examples. I, I just did a little Google and looked for some glass doors in churches. So I thought that one particularly is quite hard to see, uh, but there are glass doors there. 
um, but there's a, yeah, you can't really uh, see very well through it. There's another picture there of some glass doors just in front of a step actually as well. Um, they have put etched, they've got sort of, sort of stickers or etching on of little crosses, um, but it's not actually that obvious, I don't think, um, that there, there might be glass there. So that's uh, another example there. And I found a few that were maybe better examples, better ways to use glass. Uh, so this one's obviously got a big block of sort of etching on the bottom half. So yeah, it's not so obvious you're going to walk through something. You can tell that there's something solid there. And another one here, someone's this one, they've also got a fancy design on the doors. But again, it just breaks up the glass um, so that people aren't going to walk through them um, and, and smash into them. Um, so there, there are creative ways to, uh, to make sure your glass isn't going to cause trouble and problems for people. So you can also add some colour, obviously there's loads of uh, different stickers and things if you don't want to do go down the route of having something etched on, um, but there's lots of ways to, uh, to help with glass doors. Um, it's also really um, good to be consistent um, with whether your doors are open or not, um, or if they're shut. Um, so make sure there's a routine with how you're using your doors so that um, especially if someone arrives every week and the doors are always open, they, if they have got a, a sight loss, they might not have realised that there were doors there if they're always just walking through a doorway. Um, and then to find them one week that they're shut. Um, it, uh, yeah, again, that, that could, could cause some problems. So it's really good to have a routine with your doors. But if you do need to change that routine, then obviously it's making sure people are aware of that and telling them that either yeah, the doors will be open or shut today. Um, and particularly maybe welcome teams to make sure they're aware and uh, they're, they're thinking about people that might arrive that where the routine has, has changed and uh, making sure that they are made aware of that. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Matthew again now, I'll stop sharing. And uh, he's going to talk about signage. Yeah, thank you. So. Clear signage is important. It, it sort of goes without saying, doesn't it? Um, there should be good colour contrast in your signage between the background and the sign and possibly between the, the sign and the wall. Uh, and it should be printed in a large, uncomplicated uh, 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 font. So, um, you know, I, I mean, 24 is probably too small for for font for signs it just needs to be very clear and uh, you're probably going to do that anyway because signs need to be read from a distance so um it, you know if it's big enough to read from a distance it's probably okay um for commercial if you're actually you know getting signs produced so you know commercial signage the print is quite often embossed into a, or onto a durable material such as metal or plastic um if that happens it's actually quite useful because there are people with significant sight loss who haven't learnt braille but they might be able to trace the print letters with their fingers and work out what is being said on the side so if you've got the opportunity to have raised print uh, on your signs then uh, do take up that opportunity braille signage uh, <clears throat> is also very useful uh, don't underestimate the usefulness of braille signage but uh, braille readers might not immediately notice it because what you're not going to do is wander around a building with your hands all over the walls going, I wonder if there's a sign here. No, I wonder if there's a sign here. I wonder if there's a sign here. So they might actually need to be told that Braille signage is there in the first place. But once they've been told it's there, they I mean, I can't speak to everybody, but I certainly find Braille signage extremely useful. Uh, to maximise the potential use of those signs, you know, to make them as useful as possible, um, the signs themselves and their Braille labels they should be applied consistently throughout the building. Unfortunately, there isn't actually a very clear standard about how to do this, uh, but there are some things that you can keep in mind when you're working through it. The first is the height of the sign. Um, I was once in a building where there was a braille safety notice and the safety notice had information about how to evacuate the building and somebody came over and told me very proudly that the sign was in Braille, at which point I said, oh, well, yeah, can you take me over so that I can read the Braille? And 
that the sign was quite high up on the wall, it was above a doorway, it was at least two and a half metres off the floor, and so I would have needed somebody to pick me up or I'd have needed to, you know, step on a pair of step ladders in order to read the sign. This uh, makes the braille rather useless. Uh, if you're going to have braille on a sign, it needs to be in such a place that I can actually read it. Uh, you know, I need to be able to reach it. So um, <clears throat> you don't want to, you know, make it too low down that I have to bend down. You don't want to make it too high that I have to reach up. So, I mean, somewhere between one and one and a half metres above the floor level uh, is usually appropriate. But just, you know, be, be, be sensible about where you put it. That's the main thing. And if possible, try and put it at the same height for every sign in the building. Um, so, you know, you don't want some signs at one metre off the floor and some at one and a half metres off the, off the floor. You know, that's not much use because we'll start looking for signs at a metre above and, uh, and not find the ones that are one and a half metres above. Uh, position relative to the door. So signs, you might have them on the door, as in, you know, actually on the door itself, uh, on the wall immediately to the left of the door, or on the wall immediately to the right of the door. Um, any of those positions is fine, actually. Uh, you might decide that you want to put a sign either side of the door rather than on the door um, itself. Um, it, it's it's slightly preferable to do that because it mitigates the risk of somebody trying to read the sign while someone else tries to open the door. Um, but the, the key thing here is to be consistent about it. If you've got tight spaces and you're not always able to put a sign on the wall, please put all of your signs on the doors because what will happen is We'll find, a, we'll find a braille sign on one door and we'll think, oh, that's very good. And then we'll look on other, other doors and not find signs. And we won't necessarily think to check around. So it, it, just be consistent about where you, where you put them. And the other thing to probably talk about is where the braille appears on the sign. Um, so, for example... Um, is the braille above the print or is the braille below the print? Usually, if you're buying commercial signage, the, the, the braille label is added to the bottom of the sign underneath any raised print. Uh, due to the size of the print, it won't look aesthetically too bad. It'll just be this, you know, the, the braille is, is minuscule compared to the size of the print that you need on the sign. Uh, so it, it, you know, it should be fine. Um, if you can stick to that pattern, it's a really good idea. Um, if you can't stick to that pattern, Above the print on some signs or if the braille is on the centre of the sign on, on some signs, make it in the centre for all of the signs then we know uh, where to look. If new signage is being commissioned, braille can usually be added by the company who is producing the print signage so please ask them about that and uh, if they turn around and say no we can't do braille, uh, look for a company that can because um, plenty, plenty can do that. If you've already got signs, uh, braille labels can be retrospectively added to them using clear self-adhesive plastic material. Uh, this can either come in sheets that you can put in a braille machine and you can do it that way, uh, or you can get strips of Dymo tape and you can put it in the braille equivalent of a Dymo gun and braille it on that way. Um, please do contact Torch for further assistance with this and we can help you out with specific uh, signage projects, you know, if that's something you need help with. And once the braille signs have been installed, um, check them regularly. I mean, maybe once a year or something, uh, maybe once every two years, but put it into the regular, you know, into the regular checks. If you regularly check the fire alarm and you regularly check the fire extinguishers and you regularly check, you know, other things, regularly check the the, the signs. Um, if it's a braille label, the braille label might have fallen off, in which case it needs to be replaced. If the braille signs have been made, you know, actually out of plastic or out of metal, uh, you might find that little children have come along and picked off all the braille dots. Or, you know, somebody's, someone's bag has scraped against the sign and knocked a dot off or, or something. You know, this, this happens and um, it can make a big difference if, if one braille dot is missing. Um, it really can make it say something completely different to what is actually meant. So please check that all of the dots are still in place. And if dots are not in place for some reason, uh, try to mitigate that as, as soon as you can, either by replacing the sign or by adding a Braille label to it or, or making a new uh, Braille label if you're, um, so that people are not reading the wrong signs.
So I think the most uh, confusing aspect of a building for a person with sight loss is usually the layout. Um, so un unless people are with sight loss are specifically told otherwise, they're likely to sort of assume that the layout of a building will remain static uh, between visits. So it may take several visits for them to mentally map um, the entire layout of the building. Um, and indeed, they may not actually mentally map the building at all, but may have an expectation of what the building is like. For example, a Church of England style um, nave set out in rows. Um, and the expectation is that, you know, some people have that expectation that that is what, is what it, every church will be like. Otherwise, they may use these um, apparently static features as landmarks for navigating around the building. For example, they might count the number of paces from the front row of the nave to the chancel steps or whatever you've got in your building. Um, so therefore, when a person with sight loss visits a church for the first time, um, it's really important that their expectations are managed as to the layout. So say whether the church is in its usual configuration. Um, and if it's not, explain what its usual configuration might look like. Um, and if there is no usual configuration, if it's always changing, then again, explain this as well. So um, you don't need to feel that you need to avoid changing or altering the layout of a church simply to make life easier for people with sight loss. However, if the layout does change, um, make sure someone is on hand to familiarise people um, with sight loss with a new layout. Um, ask whether they will need extra help at the end of the service as a result. Um, and explain how long the new layout is going to be in use. If there is more than one usual layout, um, then people with sight loss will become with, familiar with each layout over time, and they may recognise the pattern of when the layout is being used. Um, if it's becoming apparent that this is the case for a person with sight loss, or the layout is specified elsewhere, um, then it's appropriate to reduce the level of information that you offer. So if there is a regular pattern, um, people will, will get used to that and, and understand what's happening over time. Um, if particular layouts affect an established pattern or procedure, then again, ensure people with sight loss are made aware of this. For example, if a change in layout of chairs then results in a change in how Holy Communion is done. Um, just be aware of that and be thinking about who, you know, whether there's people that you need to, to talk to about that. Um, always tell people with sight loss if their seats do not face the front um, and identify which direction they are facing instead. Um, this applies if, you know, if it is standard practice, um, as it's likely that the person with sight loss will face in a slightly different direction each time. Um, if the entire congregation is uniformly facing in the direction, the same direction each time, um, whether that's not the front or it is the front, um, then obviously it's only necessary to inform them um, of this once or twice. So it should be done in such a way to reinforce that there is no need for them to correct it. Um, so again, it's thinking about your own layout and, and where people sit. And I think that's a bit particularly true of movable layouts and um, when you're using chairs and, and it's a more flexible space. So when resetting the church to a usual layout, be as consistent as possible. Pay particular attention to the positions of the front and back rows um, and the spacing of any aisles. Um, again, it will have been, people with sight loss will have um, will understand the layout and, and remember where, you know, if a back row starts at a certain point, that will help them know how far up the, the other rows go and uh, the gaps between them. So again, be, be uh, consistent as possible. Um, and if there are chairs with particular fixtures or fittings, maybe there's candle poles on them, um, ensure that they are um, the same number of rows back each time and in the same position on the row. So it's just, again, having consistency um, with the layout um, if it's going back to a usual layout. Um, so hopefully that's, um, that's helpful. Um, it's, again, it's all in the, the handout. So um, 
And if you do have um, further questions about that, uh, do let us know. So I'm going to hand back to Matthew now, who's going to talk about uh, canes and guide dogs for a little while. Yeah, and this is actually the to talk about and I, I put it in really because we've talked a lot about the environment and we haven't actually talked about um how people actually navigate that environment and so i think it's probably just useful to to finish just by exploring that a little bit um so um <clears throat> actually a person with sight loss might just use their residual vision to navigate so when we're talking about colored steps and things like that we're talking about predominantly these people so people who uh, don't necessarily feel the need to have a cane or a guide dog um their eyesight is is perhaps not great but certainly functional uh, but they just need a bit of help and so this is those are those situations however um <clears throat> they might as an alternative uh, choose to use either a cane or a guide dog i certainly use a long cane i think if people can't see anything at all uh, or or people's uh, people are not comfortable navigating using their vision uh, they should be using a cane or a dog if people are regularly tripping over uh, i think that's a sign that their vision is not really good enough to uh, to navigate without a cane or a dog and uh, and perhaps talk to vision rehabilitation about that um it's important to understand actually that canes and guide dogs uh i've just kind of covered it are, are not just used by totally blind people partially sighted people do use them too some partially sighted people will have a symbol cane instead of a regular cane. Uh, so a symbol cane is just um, to show that they are uh, partially sighted. It doesn't actually do any navigating. And we talked about that in Focus on before and after your service. Uh, it's also important, uh, and I think probably more important than I give it credit for, um, to recognise that a long cane is not a halfway house to getting a guide dog. A guide dog is not better than a cane. A cane is, is not better than a guide dog for that matter. You know, uh, it's not like, oh, well, you know, I heard one person describe a guide dog as the Rolls Royce of mobility. And I just don't think that's true. Um, they work very differently and they fit very different lifestyles. Um, the principal difference is that a cane finds obstacles enabling the person with sight loss to navigate around them by themselves so if i'm walking down a cane uh, uh, walking down a church i'll be either tapping or rolling my cane along the floor and it will find a pew or a step or something and then i'll stop and take in what it's found and then decide how to deal with it unless i mean look i'm walking down the middle of an aisle if it finds a pew and then it finds another pew and then it finds another pew i'm not going to bother stopping and, and working out what it is because I'll, I'll just guess but that's how canes operate um the number of times when i'm walking in the built environment and i'll be told yes you're too close to the road and actually i mean i probably am a bit too close to the road actually but what i'm actually doing is using the curb to make sure that i'm staying in a straight line the cane is finding the curb the cane is finding the step i will get very close to that step and it will look like I'm about to fall off it, but I'm not. It's just that the cane needs to find it before I know that it's there. Guide dogs uh, can see, and therefore they've been trained to avoid obstacles on behalf of their owners. So a guide dog owner will stop a lot further away than a, from a step than a cane user will. And uh, whereas a cane user might look like he's about to bump into something before he eventually you know, works out how to get around it, a guide dog will just guide the person around it. I'm thinking about pillars and things like this. Um, a guide dog will just see the pillar and, and, and guide around it. I will probably nearly bump into it, but I won't bump into it. I'll, the cane will find it. Um, it's therefore uh, usually the case that assuming the bond with the owner and the guide dog is strong, uh, guide dog owners are more comfortable walking at speed because they, you know, they, they can rely on their guide dog a bit more. Uh, and they can negotiate complicated environments perhaps a little bit more effectively. I don't like to say that as a cane user because I think my mobility is pretty good, but I mean, it, it is true. A guide dog owner will get me up and down the street much more effectively than, uh, than a cane will. Um, however, it's still the guide dog owner's responsibility to direct the guide dog. Um, my dog is not a sat-nav is something that I <laughs> said uh, quite a lot. Um, the owner's got to be familiar with the route or has got to be a good problem solver. Um, a guide dog might over time uh, build up some sort of familiarity with a route 
uh, but they can't understand maps. They can't take directions. If you know, if if um, if I if a guide dog owner says to you, "How do I get somewhere?" There's no point telling the dog how to get there because the dog won't be able to understand you, um, and they they won't be able to learn routes on behalf of the owner. Um, while the learn while the owner is learning routes, the guide dog may also learn the route, but um, it's not learning on behalf of. Guide dogs also require regular care and feeding and they're susceptible to uh, getting unwell and needing to go to the vets. So uh, even guide dog owners are told or encouraged to maintain a basic level of uh, cane skills uh, in case their dog needs to go in for an operation or something like that. So um, that is the principal advantage of a cane. You don't need to feed it, you don't need to groom it, you don't need to take it to the vets. It might snap uh, but if it snaps, then you just buy another one. Um, so, um, you know, cane users will, will have a spare cane. Guide dog users probably will not have a spare guide dog. So um, cane users may therefore um, be more resilient than guide dog owners because, you know, they can just get their, their spare cane out of their bag. And it might be easier for a cane user to participate in activities um, due to not needing to uh, uh, arrange accommodation for a guide dog. So, for example, and I haven't really talked about this, but um, for example, if you're going into church with a guide dog, make sure there's enough space for the dog. You're going to need to make sure that there's water for the dog. Uh, you're going to have to make sure there's no one in the church who's allergic to dogs. And, and you haven't got any of those problems with a cane. You can just walk into a church with a cane and fold it up. So... Um, <clears throat> That's really all I've got to say, but just to reiterate that they are not, um, one is not better than the other. They both have advantages and disadvantages and you'll find people uh, using whatever works best for them. That takes us to the end of our session. So we have a, a, a final opportunity to ask any questions um, and then we'll give some uh, sources of further reading if people want to find out a bit more about anything that we've talked about today. So we've, um, we have had a question in the comments. So it's handles, do they need to be consistent? And what about colours and types? I assume you mean of, ha of handles. Um, so I would recommend that if possible, handles are consistent. Um, and again, it's it, I, I think it's a contrast with the handles so that they stand out on the door, especially for people who are partially sighted mm -hmm. um, and uh, being, if, if possible, being consistent as to where they are on doors. That's obviously always not always possible. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think the colour matters so much. It's more to do with the contrast with the door themselves. OK, thank you. Thank you, Linda. I've got a question. I've just thought of the safety issues. Um, some silly people, when they do buildings, um, they don't regard that the, the push on the doors is for you to go through the door, to push the door. Sometimes they put a handle. So they're thinking that you've got to pull it to go through it instead of pushing. And vice versa. Do you know the plates that we have on the doors because so, it's supposed to help direction it's supposed to help you to know whether you're going through the door or you've got to pull it open you mm. under, my understanding so if if they're not clear in our buildings do we need to change them um yes i suppose you do really don't you <laughs> i mean it's it's probably uh, fairly low down the list of priorities of things that you need to change but yes I mean in, in an ideal world yeah you wouldn't have if you're if you're supposed to push a door open you wouldn't have a handle on that side of the door you would have a, a plate to push instead yeah we, people have probably not thought about that one but it happens a lot I mean, we're, we're talking about doors without latches at this point. You know, we're talking about double doors and, and you know, things like that. Obviously, if the door's got a latch, then you'll need a handle uh, to operate the latch. But yes, latchless doors. Um, yeah. Put a plate for a push rather than a handle. And the other issue, of course, is fire escapes. Often they don't push open anymore. You have to actually pull them to you to open the door, which is ridiculous, I think. But there you go. Yes. So fire is an interesting um, 
setup really in in general because it's quite unlikely i would think that a person with sight loss is going to be navigating completely unattended in case of fire uh that th they might be but quite often especially if you've got a noisy fire alarm going off actually the person with sight loss is going to be so disorientated by the sound of the fire alarm that they're not going to be able to negotiate um also if you've got a guide dog owner and the fire alarm goes off you, you might have problems where the dog is so scared of the fire alarm that the dog is incapable of helping the guide dog owner out of the building so um whilst it's good practice to make sure that the fire exits are accessible again um having some extra help on hand in case you need to evacuate the building in case of fire is it is going to be very helpful because it's particularly disorientating at that point and not I... only evacuating the building i mean I, I might actually be able to get myself out of the building but where do i go next yes yes thank you very much uh penny you've got a hand up uh, I, sorry just 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 going back to the glass doors, um, I wonder about lighting because I, I had an experience myself and I haven't got particular vision problems. And I, I turned around on a dark pavement, and the door of the shop was lit inside, and I went smack into the glass door, which was very painful, very bloody. And um, I'm just wondering whether you need to have a, a light outside a glass door as well as inside a glass door like the entrances to churches, you know, like the ones you showed. Yes, yes. I mean, I think, yes, I think it's it's good practice to have lighting outside as well. Um, mm. And, uh, yeah, light your entrance up uh, if you can. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I think I think glass doors, a lot of, quite a lot of people do stumble over them in that, and they, yeah, can cause, uh, can cause trouble. So, yeah, thank you, Penny. Um, Rosemary, are you trying to... I'll see if I can unmute you. I am severely sight impaired and I use a, a white walking stick. I, I feel I'm not ready for a cane, can't have a blind a, a dog. Um, but I, I need a stick anyway because I'm a bit wobbly because I can't always orientate myself on curves and, and things. Now, some people notice that it's a white stick um, and actually are very kind. Other people don't notice it's a stick or don't notice me at all. So I just wondered what, what your comment would be about the value of my white walking stick. Well... I think um, some people are more observant than others, aren't they? Yes, um, yes, the number yes. of times I've walked into people and I'm very clearly blind, you know, my eyes are closed and I've got a white cane that I'm actively sweeping from left to right and I'm making yes. quite a lot of noise with it because I'm tap, tap, tapping it across the floor and deliberately uh, not being quiet because I want people to hear that I'm approaching yes. and I want people to get out of the way. Not because I feel like I deserve... Uh, to you know to, to have yeah, a clear path yeah. but because i just don't know where and, they are um, <clears throat> the number of people who don't and and who you know I'll, I'll get a telling off from them until they realize oh dear yes you're a bit blind aren't you um so <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I don't think it's just the white walking stick that is that is the problem i think uh, some people oh. unfortunately are just um not terribly observant so i think carry on with your white walking stick yes yes uh, i shall I just wondered, as you haven't mentioned ordinary walking stick, um, to, to, Yeah, to be honest, I hadn't remembered until you brought it up that you could get white walking sticks. Um, oh, yeah. I don't know many people who use them, and it had just not really occurred to me. Although now you mention it, I think I've seen them in the RNIB shop. Um, yes, yeah. But But yes, I mean, absolutely, if that's what works for you then by all means carry on using it well i i do find it useful i i, I certainly need something to just to make me a little more stable um but so i thought a white stick would be better than a black stick you know um and it and it is useful and many people do notice and and um are, are kind um 
So I think it's quite it's quite a useful thing to, to have and to recommend you know, to people that are in my state of, of eyesight, which is still deteriorating. Um, yeah, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. To find out more about Sight Loss Friendly Church, please get in touch. Telephone 01858 438 260. Email slfc at torchtrust.org or visit our website sightlossfriendlychurch.org.uk. Sight Loss Friendly Church from Torch Trust.